Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar. As usual, fascinating and inspiring uh, talk that uh, he has given on the topic of Muslim societies and reform within a changing global environment. Dr. Chandra first emphasized on when we talk about reform, the main idea goes back to what is it that we learn from the essence of Islam itself, coming from the Quran and the Sunnah. And the seven key points um, is, is, is definitely crucial matters that we need to, we need to look into uh, further on environment, socioeconomic disparities, hegemonic power, violence, corruption, abuse, ethnic bigotry, religious extremism. Family disintegration is a very important point and how do we perceive ourselves as the challenges of the individuals. And going back to this, some of the suggestions. Um, in fact, before going to the suggestions, uh, Dr. Chandra addressed the internal and the external challenges. The internal challenges within Muslim communities or within Muslim countries, Muslim society itself, is the very long historical until now um, the relation between uh, the religion, Islam, and power and authority, while at the same time having the challenges of the decline of faith uh, among um, us Muslims mainly, and while at the same time the important elements of addressing the external challenges, the crusade, the Mongol invasion, and what is all still lasting until now, perhaps you can say the effect of colonialism, and when it comes to the remedies, um, on ourselves on the leadership, education, nation state, people, the, imp the importance for us to develop global movements. One in particular which I think is interesting when Dr. Chandra mentioned about education, the two E's and the two P's because I think a lot of us, we have gone through, maybe perhaps in the earlier stages of our own Islamic education when Dr. Chandra mentioned about the two P's, prohibition and punish, that is so mainstream in our education. It's always about punishment and about prohibition uh, well, with less emphasis on the, 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 the part which is to educate and to enlighten. In fact, if I could provide a room to add a bit instead of just having two E's and the two P's, the two P's, besides then the prohibition and the punishment, my sense during my own experience of um, religious education, studying Islam itself, is the element of authority and power, P meaning to say. So it's not just about prohibition and punishment, but how the power dimension of between the perhaps uh, the teacher against the students having that kind of distinction um, and on education to educate and to enlighten maybe we could also add another e which is to empower the uh, students at a very young age to show that when it comes to practicing islam as a belief as a faith towards our ethics, the way it affects our mind, our heart, and our actions, it moves towards something which is empowering ourselves as well. So those are maybe just some simple reflections. I'm sure there's a lot of key points uh, of reflections and uh, that others uh, have also uh, gained from the talk by Dr. Chandra. I would like to open the floor for some comments or questions, or in fact, perhaps new ideas on the topic which relates to um, reform in global uh, society as well. So. Um, perhaps, Dr. Farouk, you have any questions or comments first? Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyone perhaps with some comment, just, just to spark a starting point of discussion, responding to the talk by uh, Dr. Chandra. Alaikum. I'm Tiaz Yusuf from ISTEC IIUM. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chandra. You rightly talked about 2P and 2E. And I would like to add one more thing to that, is that because of the Mongol invasion, our interpretation of Islamic history and Islamic texts has been to us interpreting them in a, in a warrior, warrior's style manner. That whenever you go to the mosque, whenever you listen to the khutbah on Friday, it is all, always about clashing and fighting and victory over others. And this is another problem which we have in our pedagogy, which has to be addressed too. Just a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I agree with you completely, Brother Imtiaz, that uh, this emphasis upon combat, about uh, being involved in, in fighting, this is something which um, has been addressed by a number of individuals. There is this point that has been made that uh, perhaps this is from Wahyu Din Khan, you know, the famous Islamic thinker in Delhi. 
And uh, he has observed once that um, if you look at the amount of time the prophets spend on actual physical combat, it may not have been more than three days of his life, total, you know, not more than three days. Because, you know, the way battles took place, uh, I think it was much more decent in those days, you know, yeah, and uh, you go and rest and you come back after, you know, maybe a couple of days, whatever, but total, only about three days, he says. And yet, if you look at the way battles and the victories on the battlefield are lauded in uh, Muslim history, the history that Muslims have written themselves, you, you give the impression that this was so central to his mission, when actually it was just a small part. Most of it was, you know, educating and administering and, you know, counseling people and all the rest of it, but this is not given in our emphasis. And uh, I saw this in the textbooks of my daughters, you know, when they were in school in, in Penang, you know, when we were living in Penang at that time. And I was just astonished that uh, there was such detailed description about battles, you know, and, um, and for that reason, Khalid ibn Walid, <laughs> I'm sure he was a great person, but you know, the way in which his personality was exaggerated and other aspects of um, Islam and early history and so on were not given that emphasis. Yes, I think it's partly because of the various experiences Muslims had gone through and also I think the unresolved problem of power, understanding power, that power must be expressed in a certain way. If you had power which is spiritual, isn't that also power? Moral power, isn't that also in a power? And somehow that doesn't figure. I agree with you. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, good evening. Um, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar, I have um, you know, some problems. Please, sorry, Balkis. Pardon? Please introduce yourself first. Oh, yeah. uh, my name is Balkis. Um, I'm currently yeah. doing certificate. I'm currently doing certificate of legal practice. Um, I used to study at Queen Mary in London. Um, I have some concerns or, or pessimisms about, um, you know, you were saying about having a um, and a platform that uh, we could all come together and, you know, being given all power equally. However, in reality, that's not the case. You know, even in the United Nations Security Council, you don't actually have that. Um, I mean, we are even divided into, say, um, developed countries, um, third world countries, least de developed countries, developing countries, this sort of segmentation in the first place. And even uh, with the um, powerful countries looking at the, you know, Islamic countries as having less sovereignty, that in itself have shown that we could not come uh, into a platform together if we are not given the same sovereignty in the first place. And even if you look at the past, you know, the uh, weapon mass destruction um, in, by the US, that has, has already shown that we could not be given the same power. So how do we come out, out of this realm and create um, a new, I don't know, world that, that we could all come together and then, you know, being given um, the same power to everyone, each state, all together. Thank you. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Um, I'm Junaid Ahmed from Pakistan and Dr. Chandra surely knows me. Um, actually related to the, what the previous speaker was saying, um, the first uh, part I, I was just going to say that we should try to avoid, um, may God bless his soul, the late Mulana Waidadeen Khan, uh, quoting him since uh, he uh, certainly, um, over the past few years of his life, uh, he was, began to write for RSS journals and for Hindu right-wing journals in India um, because his theology or philosophy was one where Muslims are to blame for everything. Muslims cannot resist in Kashmir and Palestine because they are at fault and therefore they just need to sit down, be quiet, and uh, be taken over. And some, in some future time, hopefully develop uh, to, uh, to survive and, and exist amongst uh, the 
Hindu community in India. So Mulana Waidudin Khan uh, had a theology of quietism that facilitated oppression both within India as well as where all legitimate Muslim struggles were taking place. I just wanted to point that out. I think that's very important because Mulana Waidudin Khan is not the exception to this. We have lots of Imams and Mulanas uh, throughout the Muslim world uh, that refuse to take positions on issues of uh, justice and injustice. Um, people wrote about this during the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, how much of the ulama were just content with the white apartheid regime, granting them their mosques, while they refused to uh, participate in the struggle against the white, uh, white, white apartheid regime. The second point is, related to what was uh, being said earlier, and that is the point of, of, of Muslim uh, political representation in the modern world and uh, is Muslim or Islamicate, I prefer to use Islamicate in terms of uh, the Islamicate world, Islamicate the term coming from Marshall Hodgson, um, meaning Muslim influence societies, not necessarily just Muslims, Muslims, Christians, Jews, whatever religions living in predominantly Muslim uh, majority societies. So the, the issue, it seems to, to me at least, and I wanted Dr. Chandra to respond to this, is that why we see an over, overly militarized response from Muslims uh, to the predicament they find themselves today is precisely related to the question of their lack of political representation that they uh, hold in, 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 global, in the global order. Um, that is to say, the fact that they're so disenfranchised and marginalized and assaulted directly, um, and their voices are unheard of, and their vast majority of leaders are quislings and puppets of the imperial powers and themselves, that this may in fact be one of the central causes of why we see this overly militarized uh, response by Muslims when in under situations of more equitable circumstances amongst global powers, we would not see such, uh, uh, such violent behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mujafar and Dr. Farouk. My name is Nafi Mutahirin from Indonesia. I am from Center for Islamic Studies and Philosophy, University of Muhammadiyah Malang. Uh, you have explained uh, about the challenges of uh, Islamic perspective in uh, the world, and there are seven challenges that you what is uh, you said before, and I think when Malaysia. Uh, the perspective of Islamic studies uh, become what is uh, Islamic discourse, the topic hot, but in Indonesia now uh, there are conservative turn uh, if we if we if we read from the article Martin van Brunessen because uh, Islamic populism and religious identity politic it's very uh, familiar now and according to european union to dr muzaffar how to face the muslim majority that they have the conservative turn like this thank you okay, the first question from our sister balkis asked about um, how do we come together when we are unequal? We are not talking of states coming together. That will go on. It's part of the reality. If you talk of uh, coming together, and if you look at uh, the examples I gave, it's more at the level of civil society. The climate change movement that put tremendous pressure upon very powerful states that movement was from civil society. And there are many other examples in, in history where civil society 
puts pressure upon state actors and sometimes there's some response. Most of the time there's no response, but nonetheless one goes on. Many, many movements for change have been initiated by people outside the state, not people who exercise state power. So we are talking of two different realities. Both are realities that uh, confront us today. Here I'm talking about civil society groups coming together to demand greater accountability, honesty in uh, governance and you know, ch challenges of that sort. And uh, in a sense, among such groups, there's greater equality. Even at the starting block, there's greater equality. I saw this in uh, some of the movements for human rights in the 1990s including um, the indigenous rights movement and so on, there was greater equality. And in the end, of course, some things happened that were positive in terms of some changes to laws here and there, but the struggle goes on. So that's what one is talking about. Now, Junaid's uh, comments and questions. First, the comment about um, Maulana Wahidin Khan. I think, uh, Junaid, one has to adopt a more mature attitude. I was quoting him only in relation to what he said about violence. And I think some of the points he made about violence and the teaching of violence and the adherence to violence made sense. That uh, one should be honest that the prophet was not basically a military commander. He had multifarious roles, it's true, but his greatest achievement was in introducing a certain notion of life, which it was the culmination of a long tradition as far as religion is concerned. It's not uh, the battlefield, you know, it's that, yeah? So that's why I quoted what you did. I, I'm just reminded here of uh, a very similar problem I had to deal with uh, recently. A group of individuals wanted to observe uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, recent birthday celebrations, and it was at the regional level. And um, while there are certain things about Gandhi which I admire, some of the things he did in his long struggle, and certain things which uh, I would value, there are also things about Gandhi which uh, I do not accept. So I told them that uh, I could not play the role they wanted. If I'm writing an article where I have to refer to some of those positive things and I had to quote him, I would. But I would not sort of pay tribute to the man in his entirety because of what I know, especially what I came to know the last four or five years ago. He's very disparaging comments about uh, black Africans, about the African people, Gandhi. It was really quite a shock because this is in black and white, the things that he had said about them, you know, Gandhi. So this is the point, you know, Junaid, that, you know, there are certain things that people write, say, which we should openly criticize. I don't agree with any of Wahyuddin Khan's position. I knew him personally as a person, you know, that um, he upheld in relation to the Palestinian struggle in particular and, you know, Kashmir and all the rest, uh, yeah. Now, the other point you made about um, why Muslims sometimes resort to violence, you were saying it's, uh, this is the most serious question that you raised, that they're disenfranchised, they feel powerless, and therefore they do this. I think it is a point which one has to reflect upon further. If you look at countries which were also humiliated by colonialism and how they overcame their humiliation. Different countries and different peoples had chosen different paths. In terms of a strategy, I think a lot of Muslims confronted with the past and the present, and there are others who are also confronted with present realities, they have chosen a different way. And Muslims haven't given enough attention to the different path. 
I'm one of those who's argued for a very long while that Muslims have not explored non-violent methods of confronting dominance and power. Enough, enough. There have been examples here and there, but they've not confronted these parts enough. Even on the question of Palestine, they could have done much, much more in developing those alternatives. And it goes for everything else, Iraq, resistance in other parts of the Muslim world, including Kashmir. There is a tendency to say, well, this is the way, and to resort to violence. And I think that has also something to do with what uh, Imtiaz and I referred to, a certain notion of what military power, what uh, physical power has meant in our history, a glorification of that, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we quickly turn to this and say, this is how we're going to fight this. We find the other methods more, perhaps, cumbersome, takes a longer while. My reply to you, uh, Junaid, would be what um, Gafar Khan gave. Because I think his reply made a lot of sense because he resisted. He resisted colonial rule, he, he resisted colonial rule, he mobilized 100,000 people. And his resistance had a tremendous impact. He refused to take the path of violence because he said, my method and my path is the path of the prophet. And I would argue the prophet's preference was undoubtedly for nonviolence. Look at the Treaty of Hudbiyah. Look at uh, the humiliation that he went through at Taif and other places. He didn't retaliate through violence. Yeah. He was forced into a situation where he thought that he would rather save lives than confront those who were perpetrators of violence. I think that's not happening among Muslims. I mean, we are in a closed group like this. I think we have to admit this. We can do much more in developing other alternatives. And we haven't done it here. Yeah. Now, about the conservative thing, you know, Dr. Farouk, you know, from our friend in Indonesia, yeah. was saying, why have we taken a conservative uh, turn? Well, all those reasons that we talked about, actually. External plus internal. And internal, we cannot deny the fact that uh, the monopolization of interpretation of religion by religious elites who are dependent upon state power, it played a very big role. There were very few uh, Abu Hanifas, which is why he paid the price, who stood up to state power. But most of them just succumbed and supported the rulers, what they wanted to do. We are not exempt from these things, you know. We should not give the impression that uh, if anyone says that there were tyrants among Muslims or there were Muslims who did not do what they should have done, that these are people who are deliberately distorting our history. It's not true sometimes. These things did happen and uh, these things are blots upon our conscience. You know, we have to admit it. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Chandra. I'm Huda from Sisters in Islam. Um, so basically, you mentioned seven challenges. I would like to add there is another challenge, which, which is the eighth one. Um, it is patriarchy. Because patriarchy intersects at every problem that you mentioned. For example, I'm, I'm telling you in the sense of uh, um, economic disparity. So what happened in Tunisia, the Farah case, where when Mufti Tunisia uh, support the equal, uh, equal um, distribution of uh, Mirath, it was being resisted by the Islamist group. So this is not, um, I mean, in the sense of religious um, uh, discourse, it's no problem, but when the Islamists came in and resist, it must be related to patriarchy. So it affects um, um, the, the economic disparity towards women as well in that sense. And then there are others, for example, it is integration of family. And we have, we have to bear in mind that this integration of family happens because of domestic violence. So domestic violence also happens because of patriarchy. So patriarchy intersects at all levels of challenges. I would like uh, to put that as uh, the eighth challenge so that we 
acknowledge that patriarchy is a problem that causes us um, hardly to reform our religion because when we do not address this, we cannot do this. I mean, we, we cannot reform if you don't acknowledge um, the patriarchy problem. That's it. Thank you. I'm Azura. I'm from UM. I'm doing Masters in Social Science. Anyway, uh, thank you, Doctor. And also, thank you, Huda. It, basically, what Huda was, is trying to say is basically what I'm uh, trying to say. I think in seven challenges that you pointed out, I think we are missing the elephant in the room. As you can see, almost all, no, not almost, but all the challenges I stated is caused by men. No offense. <laughs> when, you see, when you talk about two and a half billionaires uh, holds one, most of the uh, richness of the world, uh, following the statistic, 89% of the billionaires are men. Not just that, when you talk about family, fundamentalisms, ideas, is for men. And when you talk about Khalifa, about killing of power, abortion, is for men. And when you were saying about, when you were said why all the people in the world were coming together for the fronts, I was saying that people don't come together because of the hijab issues. And it's not because of women. Because if they're fighting for women, they will fight for children marriage, women get raped and everything. They don't fight for that. They fight for that. People came together for Francis because they think that ideas of hijab is the fundamental idea that women have to wear it. And men cannot see women's hair because they get their nerves of something. Yeah. And what, when you were talking about solutions, I think the solutions is, you know, when we talk about solutions, we, we, people say that we, we have to end capitalism, we have to bring socialism. But I think that, no, even socialism doesn't fight for women's rights. I think maybe one of the solutions is we have to end the patriarchal systems. Because in the end, when you talk about leaderships, even if there's new leadership that's that good, but another man comes in and there's going to be regression happening. And it proves in many. That's why we have like democratizations where now is okay and later it's not because it's, it's the same thing's going to happen again and again. And of course, when we talk about education itself, there's so many things that we miss out education in this patriarchal system, yeah, which I think is going to be more elaboration and yeah, which and that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. My name is Imran from Singapore. Um, thank you for giving such a comprehensive uh, overview of major challenges facing the Muslim world. Um, I think I will add that one of the major problem is the poverty of imagination in the Muslim world. That we have yet to come up with solutions that are not rooted in the current modern way of thinking. Um, and by that I mean the onset of modernity, which I would pin down to a very catastrophic event uh, that's even worse than what you had described through the Mongol invasion. And that is a 1492 um, triumph of the Reconquista uh, that led to a new world being formed. Uh, at the brink of modernity, which in Spain, you know, the, the, the expulsion, uh, sorry, the, the fall of Granada, actually. I, I would see that as a pivotal moment because the world before that was largely a pluralistic world. Even under Muslim rule, there was a lot of pluralism that occurred where Jews, Christians, Muslims, etc., were were living and engaging with each other. But the Reconquista, that led to the fall of Granada totally shifted because that was also the year that Columbus set sail uh, to the so-called New World. Uh, and the very things that we are observing right now in terms of the challenges of modernity were actually rehearsed in Granada. You either convert, you either kill, or you are exiled. And that sets a hierarchy of the races that sets uh, in motion uh, during that period. Now, there is also this idea of the epistemic side in which local knowledge was totally destroyed in replacement of Eurocentricism. And that is, of course, what you have mentioned after that is the age of colonialism. I think that is the major factor that we are, we are dealing with. And therefore, I will add to the reform of education two Ds, which is to decenter knowledge and to decolonize knowledge, uh, even before we can even talk about any solutions. Because even the solutions that are coming up from the Muslim world tend to be adopting the model 
that keeps us trapped in the cycle of modernity that is totally Eurocentric. So I would like to hear your, your opinions on that. Thank you, um, Dr. Chandra, for your presentation. Just one small comment. Um, I'm not trying to go into specifics because I think it's very contentious if I see the specific example of it. Um, Islam has a very uh, formalistic way of how they see things. So for example, um, when certain rulings or a certain diagnosis is given in the Quran, there is a certain um, framework or at least underlying behind why that prescription is given. So my question is this, uh, and I don't think it may be addressed here. If let's say the, the thinking of, if we are able to diagnose that, oh, actually why the prescription was given is because of the certain thinking at the time, um, should this be re-examined? And um, perhaps maybe that uh, prescription should be revised according to the modern times. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. There are two questions related to patriarchy and to the place of uh, men in society. Now, the seven areas, it's just an individual's uh, reflection on what is happening. I'm sure there are other issues that are also important that were not included and should be included, uh, not just patriarchy. And I think one is entitled to add other areas, one should, as you go along, maybe in the discussions tomorrow and day after, you would be able to talk about some of the other issues that are important here. Yeah? But um, the only thing I would caution against in relation to the two ladies who asked this question is I don't think we should push any particular diagnosis of society any particular attempt to understand problems to its uh, limit. Meaning by which we proclaim at once that the problem is men. Like, you know, someone did just now. We know that it is men who are the problem. Huh? I don't think uh, it's the sort of uh, analysis which is helpful at all. What are you going to do about it? The solution, I mean, get rid of all the men? Is that the inner solution? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to come up with prescriptions of this no sort. Besides, it has got no scientific basis. Even if you look at this short period in history where women have been empowered politically and have held very important positions, you would be interested to know, for instance, that um, the first four women who became heads of government, not heads of state, mind you, heads of government, prime ministers, all of them went to war. All of them went to war. Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, Mrs. Gandhi, and uh, I think it was Mrs. Bandranaika, the civil war in uh, Sri Lanka. All of them went to war. So women go to war quite easily. We should not conclude from that. I mean, this is why I say it is wrong to draw certain conclusions that women love to go to war or they want to prove themselves by going to war. I wouldn't draw conclusions of that sort, but the reality is, if you look at all the women leaders that we have had, quite a few of them have gone to war. And that seems to be something which uh, they have had no compunctions about doing. Both men and women, they'll go to war if the circumstances and situations suit their interests. That's what it is. Hillary and Clinton. absolutely, Hillary Clinton, you know, and uh, numerous examples of the sort. So I think, yes, let's look at the situation. There are situations where you can blame patriarchy and so on, and patriarchy has to be challenged. All that I would agree, but I don't think we should... Um, come to simplistic conclusions about, you know, men, and, or women for that matter. 
Now, the next two questions which are linked about poverty of imagination from uh, Imran, eh? yeah, that's the name, eh? Imran, and about um, 1492 is the turning point. Here again, this is problematic. If you say that 1492, the reconquest yeah, of um, the Iberian Peninsula, that this is what began everything, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, in terms of religious tolerance, yes. One very important aspect of life, yes. You know, there was a big change, major change. The persecutions, the, you know, executions, all those things, I agree. But uh, in terms of other aspects of society, including the reasons why the Muslim kingdoms declined, if you look at the decline of those kingdoms, you know, Granada was just the last, you know, but a series of them over a period of time. Again, the problem of authority and power, infighting, corruption, these things you know, were there. They were there pre-1492. And they have been with us even after many of us became independent of colonial rule. So these are eternal problems that we have to confront. And we can't sort of put a date to them and say that, you know, this is what changed everything. We should do a critical analysis of uh, post-1492, and people have done it. Ziauddin Sardar's uh, writings on it are very enlightening. And uh, I think the others have also written. We look at those things, analyze them, yes, you know, but I don't think uh, we can make sweeping generalizations, you know, sweeping conclusions from this. And uh, about the solution, decolonizing knowledge, I and mean, here again, this is a movement that has been there for a while in Muslim countries, in some non-Muslim countries. I have uh, not associated myself with this, though I have been very critical of certain colonial dimensions of our you know, thinking, like the way we look at um, something very, very fundamental, not discussed very much, but we've attempted to at least open the doors to this discussion. The whole question of human rights, the fundamental issue. How is it that we can embrace this very, very important challenge, the challenge of human rights, and not ask some fundamental philosophical questions when we talk about human rights? Because if you talk about human rights, you must have a conception of the human being. Who is this human being? What are the attributes of this human being? Why is it that this question is not raised? I remember in 1992, at a seminar in Oslo, and you know how de-religionized people in uh, Norway and you know some of the other Scandinavian countries can be. I said, for me, coming from a society that has religion as an important aspect of life, this is a very important question. When you talk about elevating the human being, I want to know what is this human being that you're talking about. Which is why, if you look at uh, some of those attempts to question this, when um, the Declaration of Human Rights was first being formulated uh, under Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, committee, two individuals, one from uh, China and the other from India, raised this question in a circuitous manner. The Chinese delegate that looked at the draft, at that time it was uh, Kuomintang, you know, it was uh, not communist right? yet, it was 47. And the Chinese delegate, he raised this question about uh, why just rights, why not responsibilities? It's a very important question. 
why do you talk of rights and not talk of responsibilities? Because in all our traditions, and you refer to the Confucian tradition, responsibility is also very important. Duties are very important. And Mahatma Gandhi, and here again, you see, tonight I quote Gandhi when it's suitable. <laughs> serves a purpose. Mahatma Gandhi, in a letter to Julian Huxley, who was at that time the Director General of UNESCO, actually, because Julian Huxley had asked Gandhi to contribute to the formulation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he gave a very succinct reply. He said, my illiterate but wise mother taught me that you cannot have rights without duties. Any attempt to formulate rights and ignore duties will come to grief. So there is this link, this nexus, between rights and duties, which is very much part of the non-Western tradition. And it makes a lot of sense, which is why, as uh, Brother Farooq knows, you know, in my own work, in Ali Run before, and in Just, I've always pushed for this, that you cannot ignore responsibilities. And I give examples that make a lot of sense to human rights advocates, as I did in, in Oslo in 1992. I said, you look at uh, something which everyone recognizes as a right, it's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to uh, fresh air, clean water. Both those rights cannot be accomplished in reality without responsibilities. You must be responsible in your attitude towards water and towards, the, towards air. Only then can you have your right to yeah, clean air, water, whatever. And the same thing with free speech. You want to protect free speech, there must also be a sense of responsibility. Which is why it is such a pity that in 1998, an attempt by a number of people to have a universal declaration of human responsibilities, it was led by some former political leaders actually, you know, the Interaction Council. It is called the Interaction Council. They came up with this declaration and it was shot down in the UN. The opposition was led by the United States. And you know what was the underlying reason? Because the United States, they were not happy with an attempt to impose responsibilities upon the corporate sector. You know, the big corporations and so on, they did, they did not want these corporations to be held responsible. So I think responsibilities are very important. So likewise, when we talk of human rights at the individual level, rights and responsibilities, a notion of the human being. And the human being, for all of us, has a spiritual dimension. And that must also be embodied in our notion of what the human being is. Yeah, so I think these are some of the fundamental questions that we have to raise. Various aspects of governance, of uh, aspects connected with, well, even medicine and healthcare, because those things involve how we look at the human being in its totality and so on. We have to raise these questions, I agree. But when you start talking about decolonizing knowledge, and then the focus is uh, on a sort of movement that is so vague and amorphous, let us Islamicize knowledge. I don't know what that means, actually. Islamicizing knowledge. I'm being very frank here, you know. Uh, Dr. Farooq, I have been against that sort of a thing. What is Islamizing knowledge? I really don't know. Because this is uh, the counter response, you know. Let's Islamize knowledge. Or someone else can say, let's maybe make knowledge Buddhist or Hindu or whatever, you know. Yeah, one could say these things. It doesn't really mean anything. I have, um, in response to this, and I remember this was a question that was asked here in KL at some meeting many years ago, and I think it was the late uh, Professor Ansari who um, raised this question with the main purpose of eliciting an answer from me so that it could be used against uh, those individuals who are championing the Islamization of knowledge. So my response to Prof. Ansari, bless his soul, was this, you see, that, uh, you know, Muslims are fond of cats. 
They're very fond of cats because of the prophet, right? That's the tradition, They're very fond of cats. So you can talk about a Muslim attitude towards cats. That's legitimate. Intellectually, it's legitimate. A Muslim attitude towards cats. They're very fond of cats. But because there is a Muslim attitude towards cats, the cat doesn't become Islamic. <laughs> All right? The cat remains a cat. It doesn't become Islamic. So we can talk of a certain knowledge and attitudes, knowledge towards science, that we must emphasize ethics in science, for instance. Uh, that is the attitude part. Attitude there is, but as far as the object is concerned, the object remains what it is. So the cat remains a cat, and uh, we can talk of a uh, Muslim attitude towards cats, but the nature of the cat doesn't change. So knowledge and some of the disciplines that go with knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge, they remain. You must be rigorous in your scientific analysis, in your collect collection of data, all those things would remain. You know, reflection, all those things would remain. So I think uh, decolonization should not be pushed to that level where people start pushing for Islamizing knowledge and all the rest of it. It's very unproductive actually, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah please, can you respond? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm in full agreement with you, and I don't mean decoloniality in the sense of the opposite uh, Islamization. Mm -hmm. In fact, to me, this whole obsession with Islamization is part of the colonial trope uh, that the Muslims were responding to, and therefore yeah. they need to extricate themselves out from that. For example, in your example of the cat, because the cat has been a Christian cat, <laughs> the response of the Muslims within this whole coloniality or colonial way of thinking is to respond by having an Islamic cat, right? So, so decolonizing knowledge is not about Islamizing knowledge. And I will argue that Islamism has been trapped in that cycle of seeing Islam itself through the epistemic and categories of how it's being defined by Eurocentric knowledge <coughs> system. Yeah. And that is the problem that the Muslim world is now facing. And decoloniality has to get out of that in order uh, to, 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 to propose new solutions. Yeah. So I'm in agreement with you, actually. Yeah, yeah we are on the same page as far as that is concerned, yes. You know, because I know that very often in responding to a certain dominant perspective, you find that those who are dominated actually use the terminology or use uh, methods of analysis that merely reinforce the very thing that they are fighting. You know, they're supposed to be fighting these things. No, I agree. This is part of the problem. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Nur Fatima. Um, uh, I just arrived at 8 o'clock from Islamabad uh, for this event, especially and uh, the invitation was shared by Janet with me. So out of my own curiosity on this subject, I just traveled from Islamabad. Um, my subject is, my area is not uh, philosophy and uh, neither uh, the Islamic history. Um, I'm more keen to know about the reforms and the state roles, though uh, it is mentioned about Muslim societies, but I think societies act through the states. And uh, as you said that, we need to build different uh, different forums, forum and societies. The civil society can work, but of course, with the help of the state when it comes to reforms. Um, I fully agree. I'm sorry I could not actually listen to your whole talk, but I came in between. Um, I fully agree with your um, with your suggestions uh, about the leadership of a state, and particularly the education, the peace, and all those uh, which you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. The one thing which is not clear to me, perhaps I want more uh, you to talk about that, that is about the religious education, when you say the religious education. Um, and this what is what we are having in Pakistan, for instance. On the one side, that is the biggest challenge of this new liberal agenda. And the other side, we have this um, uh, madrasa education, which we want to actually bring them to the mainstream education that is not so far, that is not possible since Musharraf era. 
so uh, I'm, I'm actually not clear. Um, what kind of religious education are you talking about to, to, to get it to fit in into the reforms, uh, particularly when after this clash of civilization and the Fukuyama who has taken all the victory of this, uh, this modernity. So where does it fit in the reforms? That, is my, that was my query. Thank you. Very, uh, very quickly, just um, the, the term, uh, and this I th hopefully within the next two days we'll get into, so I won't comment on it right now, but I think we have to be careful when using the term Islamism, um, and uh, if you're going to use that term, explain uh, kind of how you, what you mean by it, because there's so many terms thrown around, Islamism, Islamic revivalism, Islamic fundamentalism, so on and so forth, and then how you define it who's defining it, and all of these things. So that's one thing. Uh, the, the other thing was on the question of, uh, of patriarchy and uh, gender inequality. I think that's very important that was raised. Um, uh, but I also think that, uh, that at, that's one core element. And another core element that perhaps Dr. Chandra could have added to the long list is a very Fanonian notion of, of the zone of being and non-being, and the zone of non-being, which is, which is basically the color line, the race line, the West and the non-West. So we have a situation today which is quite unique in which white women today, just to look at this statistic, white women today have more power and wealth than all of non-white women and men. So try to process that statistic, and you will see that, yes, gender and, uh, gender and justice and patriarchy are factors, but there's a, a larger system at play as well, which is that color line divide, which Fanon called the zone of being and the zone of non-being. The zone of being where conflict is managed through regulation and accommodation and, and concessions and the zone of non-being where, where conflict is managed through violence and oppression. So we also have to look at that larger structural framework uh, when we think about gender and we think about these other things as well. Yeah. About religious education. <clears throat> You're asking how does one fit religious education into this larger perspective of education as such. I think there are some attributes of education which would apply to all forms of education, including religious education. It becomes somewhat sensitive when we talk about, uh, say, developing a critical outlook on religious education because the general tendency, I'm guessing that it, this is the way it is in Pakistan, but certainly in Malaysia and in uh, Indonesia, other Muslim countries, the general attitude is when it comes to religious education, you don't adopt a critical ap approach. I think that has to change. Indonesia, its religious education itself is quite diverse, as your Indonesian friends will tell you in the next uh, couple of days. And one of the remarkable things about uh, some of the madrasas in uh, Indonesia is the emphasis they give to critical thinking in their curriculum. The type of uh, personalities that they discuss, their writings, yeah? and the issues that are raised, which is why if you compare Malaysia to Indonesia, there is a huge difference when it comes to approaches towards religious education. I would like to see a bit of what we have in Indonesia, the positive aspects, emulated in other Muslim countries. Someone mentioned Tunisia just now and in the course of the discussions. I think that's partly because of some of the changes that have taken place in uh, Tunisia over a few decades, not just with recent uh, developments. If you look at Habib Bourguiba and so on, he had also introduced changes that were progressive in some respects. So I think that's something that we have to do 
in uh, Muslim countries. Top leadership is important. The administrative structure is important because your administrators can subvert changes of this sort because people have vested interests in a thing like this. You know, they feel very strongly and they may not allow these things to happen. And of course, the teachers and you know, others who are right at the front line of you know, education that I think would be very important. And then of course, things that are specific to religious education and specific to particular religions. These are issues that we'll have to address. But in the ultimate analysis, it's not just formal education. It is the way society itself is uh, structured. I think that is what is really important here. Now, uh, Unite's question about yet another category, you know, it's something which may be valid as far as that particular uh, statistic is concerned about uh, white women and you know, non-whites, all of them put together and so on. I've personally not come across this actually, you know, about uh, their situations. But if you're looking at disparities in society, all these things will have to be discussed. And um, when we had a conference on human rights here a long time ago, in 1994, one of the papers at that conference was by Du Bois, who raised this question about the color line. You'll see a whole chapter in that book on um, human wrongs. That's the title of the book uh, that we produced here. So it is something that is worth uh, reflecting upon. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandra, for your talk and response. We'd like to call for a round of applause. Um, all right, before ending our um, long discussion and day today, I would assume for a lot of us, uh, just a brief reminder about tomorrow's session. We're going to start our session tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, here in the same uh, hall. So. In fact, for the sessions tomorrow, we're going to have Dr. Tajul Islam from University of Leeds um, starting with a discussion on uh, the principles of Ijtihad, Islah and Tajdeed, which is mentioned by Dr. Farooq earlier, one of the, among the key principles related to Islam and reform, and uh, s some other sessions related to discussion of Islamic reform. Um, besides than that, I would like to wish everyone a very good rest uh, tonight, and see you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>